Hello, hello. Thank you so much for your invitation today. I'm going to go ahead and start the screen here. Hopefully um, you can see my slide. Perfect. We'll go ahead and start then. So I think it's a good morning for most people in the Philippines, but it could be good afternoon, good evening for the rest of you. Thank you so much for your kind invitation, Dr. Castro, Dr. Solis, uh, today to speak this morning. My name is Kentaro Nishi from University of Pittsburgh, and today I will be speaking to you about tendon biology and about studies we have performed here at the University of Pittsburgh in order to hopefully inform our clinical practice in management of tendinopathy. Here's my conflict of interest. As Dr. Sleese said, perhaps the biggest conflict of interest is I love tendinopathy and I even written a book about it. So just wanted to put that in the front before I get started. I wanted to give special thanks to Dr. James H. C. Wayne. He has conducted numerous tendon researches and I believe he is the only researcher in the United States that had received multiple R1 grants, which is the biggest federal grants that you can think of in order to study the effect of platelet-rich plasma or PRP to understand evolving tendon science. I'm very fortunate to have him as my research collaborator here at the University of Pittsburgh because he puts me in the nose about evolving sciences. Tendinopathy, as you know, is a painful, debilitating tendon condition that affects us throughout our lives. Tendinopathy refers to a spectrum of tendon disorders, including tendonitis, tendinosis, and various degree of tendon tears. Tendinopathy tends to be chronic and recurrent, and it results in a prolonged time away from activities or work. Importantly, such pain could result in compensatory movement patterns, increasing the risks for other musculoskeletal or non-musculoskeletal conditions, such as the ones listed here. With increased longevity, uh, the aggregate total expenditure for musculoskeletal disease had more than doubled over a recent decade. According to another report, Tendinopathy specifically comprises as much as 30% of musculoskeletal injury visits to primary care physicians in America and accounts for up to 50% of sporting injuries resulting in estimated 16.5 million cases per year. Today's standard of care for tendinopathy is largely palliative both surgical and also biological interventions lack high level of clinical evidences. And mechanistic information is still evolving, especially with regards to also biologics and regional medicine procedures. Although I must admit those are very exciting for non-surgical musculoskeletal specialists like myself and Dr. Jim and everyone. Today, I will first talk about tendon as a biological structure because it's important to kind of go back to the basics and understand what the biological structure and its behavior is before we begin to be able to treat it properly. Then I will talk about the effect of mechanical loading on tendons because that's what we do when we send the patient to PT physiotherapy. They load the tendon, but we have to understand what it's doing to the tendon biology. I will then share some of the important literatures to inform the true indication for platelet-rich plasma, as well as office-based tenotomy, followed by a final remark on new tendon injury prevention strategy. Tendon is a viscoelastic and neurovascular structure whose primary function is to transmit mechanical forces of muscle contraction to bones to create movements. Until recent decade or so, tendon was actually believed to be metabolically inactive once it was formed in embryo, and was thought to be comprised of tenocytes alone. However, a cell population with staminas called tendon-specific stem cells or progenitor cells, or abbreviated as TSCs, that can differentiate into tenocytes are recently discovered. And this discovery actually led us to a renewed view of the tendon as a biologically active structure that is capable of self-renewal. 
this is new information as to your surprise, hopefully. Non-cellular part of the tendon tissue occupies the bulk of the tendon tissue. And this non-cellular part is collectively known as ECM. Collagens and non-collagenous proteins, such as proteoglycans, make up this ECM. Our recent work at University of Pittsburgh has shown that the tendon appears to exhibit functional division. In this study, we had performed a meticulous microdissection of porcine Achilles tendon in order to isolate paratenone, endotenone, and fascicles, these three components. We then performed a tissue analysis which showed that the paratenone and endotenone had highly concentrated vascular tissue and substance P. Furthermore, TSCs were found in high concentration in these paratenone and endotenone areas. Fascicles, on contrary, were avascular, so no blood flow, and metabolically inactive and expressed very low stamminess with abundance of type 1 collagen expression, suggesting that paratenone and endotenone are the focus of tendon pain, while fascicles may contribute to the structural support but may have little to do with tendon pain. Knowing tendons functional division, as I described just now, helps to explain the current clinical evidences as it relates to platelet-rich plasma and tendinopathy. If you read our recently published review, we were able to point out that the animal investigation had always shown promising responses in regards to tendon regeneration when PRP was injected. However, the clinical trials have truly been 50-50. The knowledge of functional division may help actually explain this discrepancy. Animal investigations traditionally focused on improving tendon fascicle integrity, or so to speak, how it looks like. PRP seems to do a great job at this, making it look nice. But clinical studies would also need to concern PRP's effect on pain modulation, and this may require a special formula. Let's review quickly the literature on mechanical loading on tendons. As I alluded earlier, that's what we do when we send the patient to rehab for PT or OT for tendinopathy. The effect of mechanical loading was first studied in 1967 by Dr. Videk, who was a Swedish anatomist. He put rabbit through a treadmill running program for several weeks and documented increased tendon strength relative to the control. However, histologic and immunologic staining studies at that time were very primitive and he was unable to provide mechanistic information as to why tendon became stronger. Dr. Savio Wu from University of Pittsburgh in 1980 was the first to repeat a similar experiment using swine model to document increased collagen concentration with a 12 months exercise program. Numerous publications followed Dr. Savio Wu's experiments Although there are some inconsistencies, overall, exercise seems to increase tendon strength and makes tendon resilient to injuries. Being a center of excellence for ACL operations, our Pittsburgh team had an opportunity to study human tendons. In this experiment, we harvested healthy patel tendon TSCs from young active human patients at the time of BTB, or patel tendon grafting for the ACL surgery purposes. We cultured these human stem cells and played it on the silicon cell loader, which kind of looks like this in the red here in the center of the slide. Um, and this device actually allows us to stretch tendon tissue to a known certain stretching length. So we can control amount of the force that's transmitted to these tendon tissues that was harvested. We treated these tendon tissues with IL-1 beta to cause inflammation first before loading onto this device and stretch these tendons at either 4% or 8% of the original 100% um, lengths. 
4% stretching actually resulted in reduced COX-2, MMP-1, and prostaglandin E2 production, whereas the 8% stretching resulted actually in increased inflammatory markers, suggesting that repetitive small magnitude stretching is anti-inflammatory to tendon, while large magnitude stretching is pro-inflammatory in inflamed tendon, which is a clinical equivalent of tendonitis tendon. So for tendonitis tendon, small repetitive stretching is actually getting rid of the inflammation. This is something I actually tell my own patients in clinics once I confirm the absence of severe tendon injuries in order to encourage the compliance with physical therapy program. As you know, some fit patients might be a little bit sensitive to pain, a little bit timid to do exercise while being in pain. But this study actually shows that stretching that is small magnitude is actually anti-inflammatory. So I'll kind of quote the study and tell the patient, look, it actually reduces the inflammation. Of course, injuries do exist that might warrant an intervention like platelet-rich plasma, shock wave, percutaneous tenotomy, or even a surgical repair. So I typically use four out of 10 pain as a threshold to decide to go aggressive on diagnostic imaging, which at this point is usually diagnostic ultrasound because it's available in your clinical room. Let's now discuss what we know about PRP on tendon since we just talked about it. In this particular study, we had conducted an in vitro experiment using patel tendon TSCs harvested from New Zealand white rabbits. They're really cute. Um, we treated this, uh, their TSCs with platelet-rich plasma at concentration that is 3.5 times higher than the baseline. This study showed an accelerated tenocyte turnover from tendon stem cells. We saw reduced nucleostemin, which is tendon stem cell marker expression, with simultaneous increase in tenocyte-related gene expression indicating PRP's effect on accelerated tendon regeneration. This study was published in 2010 from our laboratory at Pittsburgh in American Journal of Sports Medicine, and it was referenced 258 times, becoming the single most referenced studies on PRP on tendons. As you can see from the numbers of references, there was an initial excitement amongst clinicians that the PRP may be promising tendinopathy treatment option. Unfortunately, not felt so fast. Our 2014 study is also important. This has, however, only referenced 48 times. And this is why I wanted to highlight this study in this uh, um, session. In this investigation, we actually isolated TSCs using exactly the same protocol that we've used for American Journal of Sports Medicine paper from New Zealand White Rabbits and treated these TSCs using culture media that would promote non-tenogenic stem cell differentiation. Specifically, we based TSCs in adipogenic, chondrogenic, and osteogenic media, and infiltrated TSCs with platelet-rich plasma at two different time points. When TSCs were treated with PRP early on, PRP promoted TSC differentiation into tendon tissues, regardless of what media TSCs were bathing in. Similar results were shown in every culture, whether it was bathing in adipogenic, chondrogenic, osteogenic media. However, when PRP treatment was delayed by one week and when that non-tenogenic tissue such as calcium started forming or fat tissue starts forming, then PRP actually did nothing to reverse non-tenogenic environment that had already formed. And this is such an important finding. Because this study result indicated that PRP may be ineffective for already degenerated calcified scar tendon tissue, we believe PRP may be most effective actually in treating a freshly injured tendon, such as an acute partial tendon tear. 
I am curious to hear what other experts think about my statement, but I just wanted to share this less referenced study that might be equally important as important as the 2010 paper that was well noticed. This sort of down, downer type of research is usually less appreciated. People were looking for magic bullet, but this is equally important because we used exactly the same protocol. The clinical strategy then to treat degenerated scar tendon should be to either remove or at least mobilize the degenerated tissue for optimal regeneration. Percutaneous needle tenotomy or PNT is one of such interventions where a tendon is cut usually incompletely using a needle. Dry needling is sometimes used interchangeably with percutaneous needle tenotomy, but dry needling is usually used to treat myofascial pain and therefore a tenotomy is a preferred terminology when targeting the tendon. Let's quickly review the percutaneous needle tenotomy clinical evidence is available and published. I find this recent narrative review by Stoichev's group to be very informative. In this review, authors identified three systematic reviews, seven RCTs, and six cohort studies with high quality. Elbow tendinopathy, elbow tendinopathy was most commonly studied other tendons studied included rotator cuff tendon, Achilles patella tendon, and gluteal tendons. Most studies report meaningful clinical improvement. Timing of intervention in RCT studies were, as always, actually six weeks after the onset of tendon pain to six months. Only two studies reported complications, and they included local hemorrhage, and increased pain following the procedure. Two studies demonstrated improved tendon quality as seen on diagnostic ultrasound imaging. Only two studies mentioned post-procedural rehabilitation program explicitly. Notably, there was a considerable heterogeneity in the needling protocol with the needle size ranging anywhere from 18 gauge to 23 gauge and numbers of passes used ranging from as few as three passages to as many as 50 passages. Overall, Stoichev's group in this paper concluded that the current research shows early promises as PNT or percutaneous needle tenotomy is low risk and inexpensive compared to let's say things like a PRP. However, they suggested future studies that compare PNT to a sham procedure in order to elucidate its true efficacy. I am actually not sure how available these types of options are in Philippines and in the rest of the Asia. I know as a matter of fact, for one specific procedure I will focus on called 10X or percutaneous ultrasonic tenotomy has recently become available in Asia as a first available uh, option in Asia, but in Japan. And I'm not sure if other countries are beginning to do this, but in United States where I practice, we now have various other devices that can remove and mobilize scar tendon, as perhaps discussed by Dr. Finnaf earlier. Sorry, I missed the first 10 minutes of his presentation and he's my mentor. So, you know, how could I miss his presentation? I did. So I apologize publicly here, Dr. Finnaf. These are some of such instruments. And this one on top is actually called Tenjet. And this uses technology called Venturi suction in order to remove scar tissue. This one on the left bottom corner is known as Tendon Nova device, which is the newest addition to tendon debridement device under ultrasound guidance and is the only one that is actually wireless. However, the most original one is this one on the right bottom corner called 10X, which was first approved by FDA in 2012 for use in treating degenerative tendinopathy. Here's a quick animation of how 10X 
or percutaneous ultrasonic tenotomy as opposed to needle tenotomy. PUT procedure removes degenerated tendon tissue for those of you who are not familiar with this technology. As you can see, this handheld piece has two lumens. The internal lumen vibrates rapidly at 16 point kilohertz, so 16,000 times per each second, to mobilize the scar tissue much quicker than manual needle tenotomies. The outer lumen then circulates the saline fluid in order to complete the aspiration, which then helps the body remove the scar out of the region. This is a quick sample video of percutaneous ultrasonic tenotomy performed for patel tendon, where the tendon is viewed in a long axis view and needle is coming from distal to proximal approach. The second video in the center here is that video of percutaneous ultrasonic tenotomy where the 10x device is advanced into the unechoic region of the patella tendon. Of course, patient walks out is essentially a band-aid. So it makes that tendon debridement procedure as an outpatient procedure and perhaps less invasive than traditional surgical or open removal of the scar tissue out of tendon. Again, the most commonly studied tendon, just like a PNT for PUT, was forearm elbow tendons. Of 236 forearm tendons indexed in PubMed, there was a four point average reduction in pain in one week time from the procedure, with an ultimate decrease of six to seven points out of 10 point scale over a study period, which was most commonly 12 months. I would like to highlight a couple of studies that were recently published. Dr. Majid Chelian's group in 2021, his publication is interesting because it showed that percutaneous ultrasonic tenotomy combined with percut uh, physical therapy resulted in a better clinical outcome compared to PUT alone. Bowden's study from Emory University, and of course, Dr. Kim Martner was one of the co-authors, was interesting because percutaneous ultrasonic tenotomy and platelet-rich plasma were both equally effective for tennis elbow and um, golfer's elbow. Finally, Ang's um, um, Singaporean study had an impressive 90 plus months, 9-0 months average follow-up with sustained improvement following percutaneous ultrasonic tenotomy. So long-term outcome uh, is at least being followed. Achilles tendon and a gluteal tendon also have published data showing some successes, although it seems that satisfaction rate tended to be lower than compared to that of forearm elbow tendons. Some case series size less than N or patient size of 10 are available for falling fascia, tendons, and ligaments with early successes. But of course, these are case series, so we cannot begin to even make comments on safety for larger cases, a larger number of patients, and we can obviously make comments on the efficacy for these tendons. But just wanted to highlight that recently people have been using this for degenerated ligaments, such as medioclatal ligament of the knee. Our team here at the University of Pittsburgh has recently submitted a Department of Defense grant and received a very good score, mostly based on these observations, in order to collect both animal and human data on combining percutaneous tenotomy with platelet-rich plasma for degenerative tendinopathy compared to PRP as monotherapy. Our goal is to see if micro-invasively removing non-tenogenic scar tissue out of tendon followed by PRP infiltration would result in a better clinical and animal outcomes on histology compared to PRP alone. Switching the gears, and this is the last topic I'll touch on today. Um, has anyone here heard of HMGB1 or high mobility group box one? It's kind of a hot uh, molecule because it's actually implicated in many, many medical conditions. HMGB1 is normally an intracellular protein that regulates transcription. Why am I talking about transcription? 
However, that same molecule can be released extracellularly, and this extracellular form has been implicated in many medical conditions such as lupus, sepsis, thromboembolic disease like heart attack or stroke, arthritis, or even COVID-19 because of its ability to modulate the inflammation. Our team recently published a paper that showed that the tendon is a source of HMGB1. HMGB1 is released in response to tendon overloading. And that glycerin, which is a naturally existing sweetener used in some of the candies, and metformin, which is a common diabetic drug, inhibit HMGB1-related tendon changes, concluding the HMGB1 is the main causative agent for tendon inflammation and scar formation in response to tendon overloading. Our subsequent study published one year ago actually received the best paper award from American Foot and Ankle Orthopedic Society. This study showed metformin completely halted overuse tendinopathy in mouse Achilles tendon. In this study, we used cage control animal as a control and subjected mice to intense treadmill running or ITR program. Based on our previous studies, we know that ITR results in severe Achilles tendinopathy in the mouse, just as shown here in um, the ITR group. It's looking like you know a lot of blood flowing in the picture, the third picture, but with metformin injection, Achilles tendon remained morphologically and histologically normal without any signs of degeneration after ITR program. Thinking ahead, we have actually formulated a topical lotion that can achieve the same tissue concentration in tendon as an injectable forms in order to see if we can use this lotion to prevent tendon overuse. In summary, tendinopathy is a prevalent condition. Current standard treatment is mostly palliative. Tendon loading in moderation is actually anti-inflammatory. PRP may be most effective for acute tendon injuries. Advanced tendinosis haunted by scar tissue or non-tenogenic tissue may require removal of those tissue before you can hope for a cure. Finally, HMGB1 can be a future therapeutic target for tendinopathy treatment or even prevention. Thank you so much for your attention. Here's my information and contact information. If you have personal questions, feel free to shoot me an email.